Good evening. evening. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 22. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 22. As we will finish up our three-part series, Missing Christmas. That's Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 22. As we've been going through uh, uh, this series, Missing Christmas, we talked about all the different reasons we have a tendency not to miss Christmas Day itself, but the actual Christ that is at the heart of the Christmas celebration. We looked at lots of examples of this, and when you read the Gospels, when you look at the birth accounts and the overall descriptions of uh, Jesus' life, you see a lot of people spend a lot of time in and around the Savior, and just had no clue who he was in the, and how significant he was. And so we looked at first, we looked at the innkeeper. And if you've ever seen a Christmas play, the, the innkeeper's one line is, there's no room at the inn. And the innkeeper was the very first person to miss Christmas. He missed the birth of Christ, not because he was being wicked or lazy or immoral, but just he was busy. He was so busy, he did not have time. Uh, to help a woman in labor, and the best he could offer was a barn and a manger with some animals. So we talked about how we can get wrapped up in our, our own busyness and even consider our own busyness uh, like a type of holiness and miss the Christ of Christmas. And then we looked at Herod. Herod was a, a horrendous person as we've gone through, and uh, Herod was really paranoid about losing his throne, and the further he got in his reign, the more that fear built in him that he would lose his throne. And Herod ends up uh, missing Christmas, not because he didn't know the Messiah had been born. He had the Magi to tell him that. But he ended up missing the event because his fear would allow no other king on the throne that was not Herod. And then last week we talked about uh, one of the main reasons we have a tendency to miss, miss Christmas is actually religion. Whether we're caught up in our own uh, religious rituals, and we've always gone to, to this church at this day, at this time, and sat in this pew and read this passage, and, and this is our ritual, and it becomes a habit, and it means nothing. Um, if anyone's had a, been commuting to the same job place for years and years, it gets to the point where you don't even half realize and you're making the turns, right? You can just kind of black out because you're so used to it. You're not even having to pay attention, and that happens to us in the church. We get so caught up in, in the ritual, we miss it. Or we have religious pride in that I am so good. Isn't God so happy to have me in his church? What would God do without me? We get caught up in our religious pride, and pride leads to indifference. And what it comes down to is we think we're good, and since we're good, we therefore do not need a Savior, and since we do not need a Savior, we therefore do not need Jesus. And that was the sin of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They thought they kept the law so well that, they, that God was... So fortunate to have him on their side that they had no need of a savior. And they spent all of their lives denying Jesus and his teaching. So we've gone through that. And we also talked about the Romans. How the Romans missed uh, Christmas also because of religion. But not in the sense of ritual, not in the sense of difference, but just because of idolatry. The Romans had so many idols. Uh, when you go a lot of to the, the Middle East and the Asian part of the world you find animism and a lot of uh, polytheistic worship systems that are kind of a mishmash of Hinduism and Buddhism and animism and whatever else their uncle or grandfather might have thought or had a personal opinion about. And they just mix it all together. And so the danger there is that Jesus just becomes one more idol to stick on the shelf. And I'll pray to Jesus, and if that doesn't work, I'll pray to this guy. If that doesn't work, I'll pray to this guy. And, and in America, we don't have that per se but we have our own idols. We have things that we set up, whether it's our career or our bank account or a, a, per, a particular person's opinion about us or it's a sports team. It's some kind of thing that's built up to where everything gets sacrificed for that and everything is made around that schedule. So we talked about uh, idolatry. And so bearing all that in mind, we're going to get into the, the last and possibly the most relevant reason for missing Christmas, especially uh, uh, here in North Carolina. So uh, I'm in Luke 4, 16 through 22. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day 
and stood up to read. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recover of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Saul bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? Perhaps the saddest of all is the people of Nazareth missed Christmas year after year after year. It says in Luke 2 that uh, when his family had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. And the child, that is Jesus, continued to grow and became strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. See, he grew up in Nazareth. So the gospel is largely focused on the last three years of Jesus' life with a little bit of focus right at the birth and one instance in Luke in chapter 2 where he's about 12 years old and is found in the temple studying the scripture. He was unlike any other child in Nazareth. When he accompanied his parents to uh, Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, he proceeded to actually confuse and confound the professional theologians there in the temple. And he spent 30 years of his life in Nazareth, in his hometown, and the residents never recognized him as being anything other than Joseph's son being the carpenter's son, here in Luke 4, specifically mentions this tragedy where he opens the scroll. He comes at this day. He reads from Isaiah that was specifically written about him. And he reads it and he proclaims it and says, this has been fulfilled. And he closes the book and they all stare at him. And they go, it can't be him. He is Joseph's son. He went on to tell him, he says, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. I think that's part of what makes witness in the family so hard, because they know you. When I was, I don't know, late 20s, early 30s, I had to go on a business trip to right outside Atlanta, Georgia. And I get there, and I check my phone, because I don't ever, this is back with, with dumb phones, and I never... Uh, Answered my phone, going down the road. And I get there, and there was like eight missed calls from my dad. And I'm like, Dad, is something wrong? Is everything okay? He's like, just wanted to make sure you made it there okay. I was worried about you. I'm like, I've driven places before, right? He's like, but you're still my little boy, and I'm worried about you. And I didn't understand that. And then he goes, look, you're going to have a kid in about a month. You're going to understand this soon enough. And now that Madison is, is eight, I have a hard time remembering she's not the little three-year-old that loved my little pony, right? She's getting bigger. She's getting older. She got on me the other day for messing up her bangs after she had spent time working on them. And I, I don't know. This is as long as my hair gets. There's no effort put into this. I don't even have to towel dry it if I don't want to. And it's just hard not remembering she's a little girl. And, and then I was talking to my dad about this, and I was like, I finally get some of that now. It's hard to see that. But when you've known someone so long, you have an image of them, and they're set at a, a particular time, particular place, at a, a particular age. And uh, uh, with my grandmother, my mama, um, uh, my dad's mom, I was never really older than about four years old, which was the last time I had lived across the street from her. Even when I was in my late 20s and and an ordained minister, I was still little Glenn, and she wanted to know if I still played with those old ugly men, which is what she called He-Man figures, and if I could find them, I probably would. So that was a fair statement. But we become familiar with something, and we pick a segment of it that we like, and that's where we keep it. Regardless of how they change or what changes about it, uh, that, that's how you remember that thing. And there's nothing wrong uh, with nostalgia and remembering the good times. All oh, the scriptures tell us repeatedly to focus on the good, the perfect, the blessing, 
as we sing frequently on Sunday, we count our blessings, but we can, we can get stuck in that, and we can miss something really important of it. And, and for these guys, they, they saw Jesus be born under questionable uh, circumstances at, at best, and they knew he was the carpenter's son, and they can remember him growing up and playing and you know, falling to skin his knee or, or whatever, helping his daddy in the, in the shop, and that's all they could see, and they could never see past that for, uh, for Jesus. So the people of Nazareth here are missing Christmas just because they are overly familiar with it. They knew him as Joseph's son, and they didn't view him as anything beyond that, nothing special. In fact, he, got, he became to upset them as he continued to preach the word of God. And it says they rose up and cast him out of the city, and we're going to take him to the edge of a hill to toss him off of it for blasphemy, and, had, and claiming to be God incarnate. If he was not God incarnate, most certainly was blasphemy. But he gets out of that, and he goes on his way, and you don't really see him at Nazareth after that. He kind of kind of takes off and starts to do his ministry in and around Jerusalem, where, again, he's largely rejected across the entire course of that three years as the novelty of his preaching and teaching and healing and feeding, as the novelty of all that wears out. As people start going, well, we've seen this trick before. We want to see something new. As that wears out, you see more and more people not only become familiar with him, but become contemptuous of him. And that's the danger here in America. We take so much for granted. There's, I don't know, last count, 80, 90 churches in Person County, give or take. 90 churches in an area you can drive across in 20 minutes or less, depending on which one of you is driving, right? We have Bibles everywhere. And if you don't have one, we will get you one. I can buy one on my phone. It'll be here Friday, right? <laughs> Almost any type of Bible you want. I can get you an audio Bible. I can get it on MP3. I can get a video Bible. I can get ones where actors are playing out all the scenes uh, to Scripture. We can go to the Dollar Tree, and I can buy you a stack of them. We can get them in different sizes and shapes and colors and translations and study aids and, and maps and we have a wealth and it's amazing and we take it for granted you know i remember over in china uh, many of the sections we were in it was illegal to be in possession of a bible and if you were american you were allowed to have one bible in english on you that you kept to yourself the Gideons would come in and try to stick them in the hotels, and they would kind of let them stick them in the hotels, and then they'd turn around and toss them right back out. And the one Christian church in one of the bigger cities in China, the only way you were allowed entrance in by the guards is to show them a passport to prove you were not a national citizen of that country. So we take it for granted. We can get up Sunday morning or Wednesday night, or realistically, almost any other day of the week and find a church service in driving distance. We can turn on the radio to K-Love or Victory FM or Spirit FM or on your phone, there's a hundred different stations that will teach and proclaim the gospel. And we've, it just almost has become background noise to us. We've just become so familiar with it, we don't deem it as anything special because any of us can do it. And we become over familiar with it and, it, and it's, we start to blank it out in the background. And eventually, as we become over familiar with it, we start to become contemptuous of it, and it strangles our conviction. When you've heard something so many times without it making a change, without doing anything about it, it just really, really gets harder and harder to make that proper change. And I, uh, I'm going to switch over to, uh, to Luke 15. Seems like an odd place to go, as I thought, but I think it all pans out. Luke 15, 11 through 16. Now, every, most everyone who's been in church for a while has heard this story. If you've been in church for a while uh, outside of, of December, where you hear about the birth, and Easter, where you hear about the crucifixion, the resurrection, somewhere in the middle, you've heard two stories. You heard the Good Samaritan, and you've heard the prodigal son. And I think the prodigal son is actually a really good Christmas story. And I think it's a really good illustration to talk about the dangers of familiarity. So I'm just going to read a section of the prodigal son, uh, Luke 15, 11 through 16. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. 
And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, and not so many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And who had gladly had filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. So when you look at the prodigal son, it's actually a, a story about two sons, and we could, I could spend probably six, eight months really breaking all of this down without covering a ton, in all honesty. But you, you look at it, and I want to focus a little bit on the first son, the younger son, and it helps to understand the culture. So we picture this in terms of getting an inheritance, or inheritance early. And for the majority of us, inheritance is going to amount to two things. Money left over from a, a life insurance policy or some type of retirement policy that once it pays off all the debts and uh, covers the funeral expenses, maybe there's enough left over that you have a nice Christmas or you go on a short vacation. But it's not a, most of us aren't in line for some huge inheritance. If you are, please remember all our mission trips. We would love you for that. That'd be very helpful. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, in this time frame, you don't have a ton of actual like cash money like we think about it. Most people's wealth back then would have been land and livestock. That was a vast and slaves. That's, the, that's your wealth right there. So when you hear about people that were wealthy, they just had a lot of people. They had a big farm, they had big land, and so they were selling off their livestock or they had a bunch of slaves and servants working for them, people that owed them and then thus they were working uh, to work it off. So whoever this gentleman is, he's done well. He's done well to have a significant amount of portion. And so uh, the law was when uh, the father passed, the inheritance passed uh, to the sons, and typically the oldest son got more than the younger son, but that inheritance was land. And you weren't supposed to sell the land because of uh, uh, Old Testament uh, Jewish inheritance laws. Because the land was supposed to stay in the family. And it was so important that the land stay in the family. Even if you deal, did sell the land, let's say I sold my family land to David, within X amount of years, when it hit something called the year of Jubilee, David or David's family had to give that land back to my family. So the closer you were to the land of Jubilee, the less money you got uh, for the land that you were selling. And so people were, were less likely to buy land the closer it was to it. And so when, it, when the young man goes to his father and says, I want my inheritance, he's saying, I want my land. And this is a big insult. Because what he's saying is he's saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I'm only sticking around to get my land. I want my land now so I can sell it and I can leave. Now, proper cultural response from the father is A, to slap his son in the face. All right, we get that one. B, do so in a public manner. C, declare him dead and actually have a mock funeral for him and cut him off. So he's exiled from the family. He's exiled from the land. He's likely exiled from whatever area he is in. He is cut off. He's all intents and purposes legally dead to make this. And to do this, the young man would have been aware that is the most likely reaction to his scenario. But he had become so contemptuous despised his father so much that he didn't care anymore. Basically, he's going, I wish one of us were dead. Either I wish you were dead or I wish I was dead. So I don't have to live under you anymore. And the only thing more scandalous than the fact he made that request was that the father, request, uh, the father granted it. He said, okay, I'll give you what's yours. And so that's what he did. So he gives, he gives the young man... His land, the young man goes and sells it. And imagine uh, as much of a hurry the young man was to get out. And given the scandal, there wouldn't have been but so many people that would have bought the land to begin with just because of the insulting nature in which he received it. So he probably got pennies on the dollar for it. So he takes his money and he goes out of country. And out of country means he leaves Israel, he leaves his homeland, he leaves where he's from, and he goes to a Gentile land. And so to all the listeners of this parable, this is a terrible sounding thing. It would be the equivalent of me saying, I wish my dad was dead. I'm going to take the money that should be mine once he dies, and I'm going to defect to North Korea. That would be like the modern day equivalent of that. 
Just like one of the worst things we can think of. And so he goes, and he has his money, and he has a good time. Uh, sometimes uh, we pastors mistakenly get up here and say sin isn't any fun. Well, that's not entirely true. If sin wasn't any fun, we wouldn't do it, right? <laughs> sin isn't any fun in the long term. Short time, we're having a blast, right? You have fun in the evening, the morning's not so great, or whatever time frame it was. So he goes and he spends his money on stuff that would be on par with probably the absolutely most depraved and wildest weekends we, we've heard of in Vegas or wherever it is you go to do terrible things like that. So he goes and, and spends all his money on, on women and partying and uh, that, that concept, their concept of alcohol and drugs, and there's probably gambling, and who knows what all that he did. But when he gets into prodigal living, we don't really, we think prodigal, is that's that guy that left and came back? <laughs> When you actually get into the Greek for prodigal, it's one of the most uh, despicable words they could use for the way uh, he used his money. And it said that he spent everything that he had, and then there was a severe famine in the land. So two things happened. One, he wastes all his money, and he's broke, and he's in another country. So if you've ever been in another country, especially like short term, and you're really ready to get back to America where there's actual toilets that flush and food that's most likely not going to kill you, and, and you get back to that, and you're ready to get back to that, that's one thing. When you're faced with the fear of being stuck there indefinitely, as I have been, which is a story for another time, you pray right then. I'll tell you what, it makes you very religious regardless of what your stance is. Oh, Lord, please get me home, you know? And so he's there, and he's stuck in this other land, and all of a sudden this severe famine hits. And so one of the, the side points is here is, we get in a lot of bad situations because we make stupid, sinful choices. And we get in a lot of bad situations because of stuff completely out of our control. And typically, most of us, the things seem to coincide an awful lot. <laughs> and so the severe famine hits, and he began to be in want. So again, we're missing something in the Greek. When it talks about he began to be in want, most of us, some point or another probably have experienced want to the degree that we experience in America. We, some of us uh, know what it's like to, to do without or to sit there going that, I hope this paycheck makes it to the next one. We've, we've kind of been there to some degree or another. Now, first off, as Pastor Dave always says, no one goes hungry here because they haven't told us, right? So if you're in that situation, we're here to help. We are not here to pay your cable bill, though, by the way. So that's, that's not a need. You can toss that one. So just, just to get that out of the way. But the young man began to be in want. And the implication is he had never once in his life wanted for anything. So that implies that he had it really good growing up because his dad was well off and his dad had land and his dad had servants because we know that he goes on and mentions the servants. And his dad had provided for him everything he could possibly have needed and most of what he wanted. As far as we can tell, from this parable, the, the father was a loving, good man. And uh, um, I tell you parents out there with, with wayward children, sometimes you have done everything you, you can, and it's not enough. And uh, at that point, you just got to hand them over to God and sometimes let them just go out in the, to the foreign country and learn the lessons the hard way. But he'd never been in want before. And he was so in want. It says he joined himself to a citizen of that country. Now, there's a little bit of debate of what that actually meant. I'm leaned towards he sold himself into slavery because that was the only way, that was the only option he had. Some people said he just hung around to this guy until the guy finally had pity on him and, and gave him a job. Same concept, realistically. So he sells himself into slavery. He's got nothing else available to him. He's about to die. And in desperation, we will do anything to attempt to preserve our lives. And so he goes and sells himself uh, to this random person that was willing to buy him, someone apparently that at least still had livestock uh, during the famine, and he gets the worst job possible, feeding the swine. Anyone here ever worked on a hog farm before? That is some nasty stuff. I'm going to tell you that right now. My, my uncle, my uncle Wayne, my kids call him Uncle Pig because he had a hog farm for quite a while I was growing up. And every once in a while, I had the misfortune of having to help, help slop the pigs. And so I had this little bucket by the dinner table, and whenever they were done, the scraps went in the bucket, right? 
from whatever, from breakfast, from lunch, from dinner, and then it went out and fed the pigs. And the pigs are just fighting over it like it's the greatest thing ever. Like they will eat stuff that is inedible by human standards. If it's remotely edible, the pigs will eat it, and they can crunch it, and they, they will swallow it, and then they become tasty bacon. So that's a, <laughs> that's a miracle if you ask me. If you watch what we feed pigs and then eat bacon, that's a God-honest miracle. I'm going to tell you. Uh, when, when you're uh, not about to eat, you can go on the Internet and watch about some of these hog farms in Vegas. And all the buffets in the casinos, all the leftover food goes in like giant buckets, which goes into dump trucks, which goes through a massive blender, and then goes through a trowel and becomes like this brownish slime, and it feeds the pigs. They said the smell <laughs> is the main reason they can't get anyone to drive those trucks. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, a, I just want you to understand, this is a nasty, nasty job. And it got so bad, the young man became so hungry that he gladly would have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. What that actually is is a, is a carob pod. There's no practical use for humans to care of carob pods other than feeding pigs with them. We literally cannot eat them. They crack our teeth, they poison us, and they have the consistency of leather. He was so hungry that if he could have eaten them, he would have. And so this is what happens to us. We become familiar with the things of God. We start to resent the things of God. We start to look at the Bible not as a love letter, but a book of rules. It's trying to keep us from having fun. And I'm going to go out there and get my freedom, and I'm going to do what I want. And I don't care what God says. I'm going to do what I want to do because, because I know what's best. And then you end up, if no one is there to intervene, if people let you just keep going, if you refuse to accept the gospel, you end up here feeding swines, wishing you could eat carob pods. And what happens with the young man is what I consider the, the true miracle of Christmas. At Christmas, a, a lot of times we have a tendency to preach about Jesus, but not actually preach Jesus. We'll tell the stories, we'll tell facts about the wise men, we'll talk about the shepherds, we'll talk about Herod, we'll talk about the birth of Jesus, we'll have the play with the little baby, and it's like, oh, little baby. But we don't actually talk about why Jesus is here. And what happens is the young man, later on in the story, it says he comes to himself. And he goes, boy, am I an idiot. My father's servants, the lowest slave in my father's household, on which I was in charge of, eat better than I do. In fact, they have bread enough and to spare. So the father was very generous in that his slaves ate well. Slaves were not, uh, historically were never treated really well, but this father treated his servants and his slaves well. They not only have enough, not only did they had food to eat, but they had more than enough in extra. That's unheard of uh, in this part of the world. And he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go repent. I'm going to tell my dad I'm sorry. I'm going to tell him I understand that I'm dead and I'm no longer his son. And I'm going to beg him just to make me the lowest ranking servant. And the reality of this parable is it's better to be the lowest ranking servant in the house of God than to be one of the princes of hell. Amen. And so he comes and he goes, and the father looks at him and sees him from a distance and runs and embraces him and wraps his arm around him and says, My son has come home again. He was once dead. He is alive. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas, that we were all once dead in our sins. And because of Jesus, because of the miracle of that birth, because of his death and burial and resurrection, that we are all alive again. And it's easy to become familiar with that and to take that for granted. But I, I struggle with that too. But like at Christmas, I really try to focus on that and remember that newness of life we have in Christ. Um, to wrap all this up, we talked about all the reasons we kind of miss Christ. But the reality is a lot of us just simply to refuse to either believe or accept Jesus. See, the reason we miss Christmas is that it proclaims the birth, not of a king, but of the king. Jesus comes as king of kings and lord of lords. And when we're honest with ourselves, we like Jesus everywhere but on the throne. We don't want him there. He can be in his workshop and fashion the world and the stars and spin the heavens. 
He can bring up the sun and, and bring out the moon, and he can call the ocean's tides to rise and fall. We beg for him in the hospital for healing and for comfort. He can sustain the earth. He can make sure we have jobs and money in the bank account, and we're all fine with that. But when he comes and sits upon the throne and makes us get down, we gnash our teeth, we shake our fists, we curse his name, whether in word or in deed. And when we stand to proclaim an enthroned God that it is his right to do as he wills with his own, to arrange and decide manners concerning us, as he thinks well, without consulting us in the matter and not in needing our input in the least, we will turn a deaf ear to the gospel. We will reject the people of God and we will disfellowship ourselves from whatever church dare speaks such terribleness to our ears. It is not God on the throne that we love, more often than not. It is the God that is there to give us what we want but it's almost never the God that is telling us uh, what we need. But it is God on the throne at Christmas above all else that we must recognize and proclaim. And it is God on the throne that we have to trust, obey, and willingly submit to. So if you've been missing the reality of Christmas in your life, or just for one of these many reasons have allowed it to pass you by so far this year, know that when you receive the name of Christ, we believe in that name, Christmas for the first time or for the first time in a long time will become very, very real to you. And you don't have to wait for Sunday or a Wednesday night. It can happen any place, any time, anywhere when we're willing to accept the birth of the King. Rick Legrone, welcome back. Close us in a word of prayer. Oh, Father, we thank you for this evening and this lesson that, that you laid on Glenn's heart. Lord, we just ask that you be with us as we we leave here and go to our homes, keep us safe, and Lord bless us until we get back uh, for our next appointed meeting. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Love you guys. Merry Christmas. <laughs>